Okay, Justin, I want to get him at least one. Good of you. Name tags for everybody. I had no way of it. Did you? Did you ask your friends if it was worth it? They said yes. Okay. You want to start? We, uh, my voice is still not back to normal, so I don't have quite the uh, projection I usually have. Also, if I sound as though I have a rock in my mouth, it's not that I'm Demosthenes, it's that I'm trying to keep my throat moist. <clears throat> I think I can tug your heartstrings later on this afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to try. But before we do that, I'd like to uh, return to nature and look at the end of this essay and talk about the uh, sort of the essential code that Emerson offered to really American thinkers, American philosophers, the people uh, in the 1830s. I, I read the introduction to nature last week, if you recall. I'm going to skip over all the rest of it, except to say that what that essay does, it's a small little book, about that big, is consider nature in its various forms, asking the question over and over again, what is nature in terms of commodity, that is use? What's nature mean to us? How can we use it in terms of language? What is it that language comes from nature in terms of ideality? Constantly going up from step to step to reach a level where he can think about nature in its most meaningful terms. We won't go through that. It's a complicated and long section. But the ultimate goal of the, of the essay is to argue the point that nature is there as our means of communication with God. If you want to use God as the word that is representative of the essential principle in life. Something to, to remember when you read nature is that Emerson is not an orthodox Christian anymore. He ultimately gives up his, uh, his ministry, even though he comes from a long line of Puritans. But Emerson's motion is <coughs> constantly to ask you to see right. And by seeing right, he means to pull back and see the various elements of experience in proper perspective. And for Emerson, this means, in the long run, depending upon what area of life you're looking at, going through the particulars of human experience to find the eternal truths that unite all experience. In, in philosophical terms, Emerson is a Neo-Platonist. So he's also other things. But that means that he's a man who returns, <coughs> in essence, to the platonic principles of what is true, what is beautiful, what is lasting. And in simple terms, what, what Plato argued in classical Greece was that the real was what was behind the particular. Um, I remember the argument or the illustration given in college. Every one of us knows what this is. It's a chair. But, but what is what chair means is, in fact, behind every individual chair. Insofar as we have chair, it means this sort of yellow-green chair that's standing here. But if you want to know the reality of chair, you have to go back to the common and the common qualities that make chair as a phenomenon. You have dogs, you have Rex and uh, Rin Tin Tin and Fido, but if you want to know what reality is, it has to be the commonness that no individual dog can represent, but a particular truth behind it. it <clears throat> that ultimately becomes right, a variation of idealism in which what is most true is what is behind the particulars of experience. And Emerson shares that quality, which is to get beneath the particulars of experiences to see truth through the moment. Emerson will constantly ask us to go through to find truth. And depending upon what area of life you're looking at, it will, it will be accessible. And this means, in simple terms, ac accessible as we are ac have access to God or to beauty or to truth, or to reason. <clears throat> these will all come together in a fashion that makes these terms, in a sense, synonyms. They tend to mean the same thing. When you get, so you get art. These are 
These are terms that uh, are attached to particular experiences, but share that access to the universal truth, which for Emerson is intrinsically good. Emerson is a man who believes that the core of the universe is good, as God is good. So art, beauty, truth, reason, right? moving you up the scale, in platonic terms, to get in touch with what infuses all creation. And if you're an artist or a poet, it is beauty that you move towards. If you're a philosopher, it's truth. If you are someone interested in logic or understanding, it's reason. And Emerson, these terms are, if they have capital letters in particular, <clears throat> are all representative of that, that attempt to get access to God, what we would call it. And Emerson tends to use the word God pretty much interchangeably with a few other terms which he offers us. You can call it God. If you're Emerson, you might call it the Oversoul or the World Soul. All of these are his way of saying that we participate in in the world successfully only insofar as we remove the narrow egotism we talked about last week and get in touch with the spirit that we all share as human beings and as part and parcel of nature. Emerson is not going to be interested in arguing dogma with you. As the divinity of Christ, for example, is for the most part uninteresting to him. He's not interested in it. He quits the church because they want him to argue certain dogmas. But Christ's role as a man who had access to God is as important to him as it is to any of us. But he's uninterested in traditional dogma, and it makes him, in many ways, a radical, certainly a heretic in, in traditional orthodox terms. Most surprisingly, most of us in uh, America since his day have tended to ignore the radicalness and take his essential goodness pretty much to heart. You will frequently hear Emerson being quoted by ministers in the pulpit <coughs> and priests because what he argues is very much compatible with what modern Christianity tends, want, tends to want to say about God and about Christ, which is that God is a God of love and that one <coughs> approaches God insofar as one <coughs> excuse me, approaches other human beings and nature as expressions of God's love. Now, <coughs> look at the, turn to page 55 and we'll do some reading today. Here is he's, <coughs> in a sense, this is his, <coughs> excuse me, his peroration. He's bringing us around. Throughout all of Emerson, you will see the minister. He is constantly preaching, though he gives up being a minister. He went around the country and, re and read his lectures to audiences, trying to get them to step away from the narrowness of their own lives and to accept the challenge of being a human being open to the world around them and to the people around them. I find teaching Emerson probably the last invigorating experience in American literature, The Whitman uh, comes along around the same time, and Dickinson does some too. But Emerson's sense, which, in which he argues so strongly, that it is in fact good to be alive, that we are not actually isolated in our oneness, our aloneness, that we have access to God, and to goodness, and that what we must do to survive as people is to accept that challenge. Not to isolate ourselves, not to become me-oriented, but to reach out to the world around us and have faith that your self is worth trusting and you can do it because you are, as a human being, worth relying upon in yourself. The students at, at uh, the UW and at Eastside react quite positively to this, and I think most of us do need a shot of optimism now and then no matter how much philosophically we may agree with Melville or Hawthorne, that the dark side of life is probably more prominent. So here we see at the end of nature, Emerson trying to bring us around to some marvelous truths, <coughs> which are, about, which are I, I would argue, in fact, truths. At the top of that page, let's read this uh, in the next page to show how he brings this essay around. The problem of restoring to the world original and eternal beauty is solved by the redemption of the soul. That opening phrase tells you what he wants to do. He wants you to have an original relationship to the world. He says so much of our lives is taking things secondhand. Someone else says, oh, to be good, this is what you do. Your minister, your priest, your friend. And you say, oh yes, <clears throat> that's what I will do because you're a minister, therefore I will be good. 
Emerson says if you're good because someone else tells you how to be good, you're not good at all. You're just obedient. Right? Emerson says you have an obligation to face life on your own terms. Original, in other words, not secondhand. He constantly undercuts uh, what we would call adoration of the past. He does not believe you do things because other people did them. He doesn't believe that because an elderly person says, I have learned the lesson of life, that every young person should take that lesson to heart. In fact, he says you have to live your own life. And certainly old people and wisdom is all fine in its own place, but every young person should face life on his own. And something you and I, I think, all know is that there's no way of avoiding that. I've been around, t I've been, pe been teaching young people for 15 years, and I know very well that I can give them wonderful lessons in life, and they still ignore me and go out and make their own mistakes. <laughs> this, is, this is life. So the ruin or the blank that we see when we look at nature is in our own eye. If you can't see it when you look around you, it's not nature's problem. Guess whose problem it is? It's your own. It's perspective. The axis of vision is not coincident with the axis of things, and so they appear not transparent, but opaque. It's amazing how <coughs> up-to-date he is. He's talking about Polaroid uh, sunglasses, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. He says, most of our problem is that we take, we look through our sunglasses like this, and if you try to look through Polaroid sunglasses so your axis of vision is not coincidental with the axis of the way they make those glasses, you won't see anything. And he says, most of us see that way. We see obliquely, and therefore all we see is a wall. If you see right, voila, the Polaroid glasses are perfectly, perfectly transparent. But most of us, in fact, do not. See, he took as his role in the 19th century the helping of people through exhortation and through essays to see right, to get those glasses on properly and see through. The reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited with himself. He cannot be a naturalist until he satisfies all the demands of the spirit. Love is as much its demand as perception. Indeed, neither can be perfect without the other. In other words, you cannot demand a proper relationship with the world unless you see right. You can't go through saying, give this to me, give this to me. It's a matter of once establishing one, one's relationships properly, and then it comes of its own accord. The way beauty last week, remember? When he gave up saying, I want this beauty, this is mine, as soon as he said, oh, I'm sick of that, nature just poured in when he relaxed and allowed it to come. In the uttermost meaning of the words, thought is devout, and devotion is thought. Deep calls on to deep. But in actual life, the marriage is not celebrated. There are innocent men who worship God after the tradition of their fathers, but their sense of duty has not ex yet extended to the use of all their faculties. And there are patient naturalists, but they freeze their subject under the wintry light of the understanding. Well, <clears throat> anytime you're reading Emerson, when you find words like that coming up, you should have bells ringing. See, Emerson will set this word up against this, this word. For Emerson, uh, one of the great weaknesses of Americans <coughs> is, their, uh, is their obeisance, their bowing before understanding, logic. This is what we call reason. I want to know the truth, the scientific frame of mind. Emerson says, we want to understand things, and if you want only to understand things, you will never come near the truth, which you acquire only through reason. And reason is an intuitive faculty. It's that leap that takes you in, in touch with God. <clears throat> you cannot come to God through reason, that is, through understanding. There's no arguing. Any minister will tell you this, that faith is a consequence of a leap of acceptance that the mind will never bring you to. Emerson says he wouldn't call him God for the most part, but the over-soul, the world-soul. If you want to know truth, you have to give up logic, as Melville says, to the hell with to the dogs with the head, I stand for the heart, and lead through that to reason, which is that connection. Anytime he says understanding, you should have warning bells ringing, because he does not believe that understanding or scientific logical processes is the way to truth. Just the opposite. It's a way of a certain kind of truth which will limit you if you stay at that level. <coughs> <coughs> 
And so he says there are naturalists that freeze their subject under the wintry light of understanding. There are people whose whole life is dealing with nature, who never go beyond what's the relationship between the bee and the flower. And if all you're interested in is botany or biology, you'll never come to understand the meaning of nature, which is vastly more important than that, which will give you access to this, to God. Is not prayer also a study of truth? And, you know, science versus religion. Uh, see, uh, is it C.P. Snow? The two worlds? He says prayer is, is, access, is, is access to truth certainly as equal and equal to science. A sally of the soul into the unfound infinite. No man ever prayed heartily without learning something. But when a faithful thinker resolute to detach every object from personal relations and see it in the light of thought shall at the same time kindle science with the fire of the holiest affections then God will go forth anew into the creation he does not believe in the double split that is in the split between God and religion and science biology if you cut them in two you lose control you lose access to, to real truth then he moves up to a marvelous ending in this essay it will not need, when the mind is prepared for study, to search for objects. If you remember Dickinson, right? It is the poet that makes you want to see the flower next to your door brand new. It's the ability to see God in common things. Or Tennyson, right? Flower in a crannied wall, I pluck you out of the cranny. If I could know what it means to be a flower, even this stupid flower in a wall, then I would know what God and man is. Or as, uh, remember, as uh, Whitman said last year, a mouse is enough of a miracle to stagger sextillions of infidels. <laughs> if you could look at a mouse and see what it means, it would defy all infidels because the presence of all life in creation is in that furry little rodent that eats your food. Yeah. The invariable mark of wisdom is to see the miraculous in the common. What is a day? What is a year? Remember how we started out? If we could see the stars once in a thousand years, how we would marvel, how we would send that message on to our children and grandchildren about there was a day when this incredible vision of lights appeared. But because we see it every day, in other words, because it's common, most of us don't even bother looking up. Seldom look up to see them. What is a year? What is summer? What is woman? What is a child? What is sleep? To our blindness, these things seem unaffecting. Don't ask me those questions. They're boring. It's the most offensive word to me as a teacher. I can't stand it when a student says, oh, that's boring. It's usually some sophomore who doesn't know a damn thing about anything, right? And they come up with, it's boring. These things seem unaffecting. We make fables to hide the baldness of the fact and conform it, as we say, to the higher law of the mind. But when the fact is seen under the light of an idea, the gaudy fable fades and shrivels. We behold the real higher law. To the wise, therefore, a fact is true poetry. And the most beautiful of fables, these wonders are brought to our own door. You also are a man. Man and woman and their social life, poverty, labor, sleep, fear, fortune, they're known to you. Learn that none of these things is superficial, but that each phenomenon has its roots in the faculties and affections of the mind. While the abstract question occupies your intellect, nature brings it in the concrete to be solved by your hands. It were a wise inquiry for the closest to compare point by point, especially at remarkable crises in life, our daily history with the rise and progress of ideas in the mind. So shall we come to look at the world with new eyes, vision, always seeing things right. It shall answer the endless inquiry of the intellect. What is truth? If you see nature right, it will answer. Remember the opening paragraph said, you can't ask a question that can't be answered. Nature is willing. If you can ask the question, it has the answer. What is truth? And of the affections. What is good? By yielding itself passive to the educated will. 
Same word as used in the poem we read last week. I yielded myself to the perfect whole. Notice that? Giving in. Let it come. Then shall come to pass what my poet said. Nature is not fixed, but fluid. Spirit alters, molds, makes it. The immobility or bruteness of nature is the absence of spirit. To pure spirit, it is fluid. It is volatile. It is obedient. And here's one of his great arguments. Every spirit builds itself a house, and beyond its house, a world. And beyond its world, heaven. Know then that the world exists for you. For you is the phenomenon perfect. What we are, that only can we see. That's essential Emerson. He's saying to the individual who reads or listens to his lecture, every one of us creates the world we live in. If you're satisfied with a garret or a jail, as you see your life as a prison, that's what you've got. If you're satisfied with a mansion, that's what you've got. If you want heaven, you've got that too. We create our world. The whole world, Emerson says, exists for you to live in. Unfortunately, most of us satisfy ourselves with a few herbs and apples, don't we? Instead of taking the sky that holds them all. Emerson wants us to say, I want more than the limitation of the narrow garret that I live in, the hubble. If you, as a spirit, can ask for more, the world is more than willing to give it to you. And it's a challenge that Emerson offers constantly to every one of us. His disciple, Thoreau, this, does the same thing in Walden. Thoreau says, have you asked yourself what it is to be yourself? Have you got rid of the burdens you put on your back to get down to the simple truth of what it is to be a human being? And all of Walden is just that effort to create, to find the world available to you. That is, you are what you see. I think most of us realize how true this is. If I wake up and I'm testy, uh, the whole day turns miserable. It doesn't make any difference if the sun is shining. Everybody gets in my way. Those miserable days when you get out of the wrong side of the bed, the angle of vision creates the world around you. And vice versa, the most horrible day is wonderful if you approach it in the right attitude. All that Adam had, all that Caesar could, you have and can do. Adam called his house heaven and earth. Caesar called his house Rome. You perhaps call yours a cobbler's trade, a hundred acres of plowed land, or a scholar's garret. Yet line for line and point for point, your dominion is as great as theirs, though without fine names. Build, therefore, your own world. If Adam could do it, why can't you? It's a strong argument, isn't it? Very powerful to think about it that we limit ourselves. As fast as you conform your life to the pure idea in your mind, that will unfold its great proportions. A correspondent revolution in things will attend the influx of the spirit. So fast will disagreeable appearances, swine, spiders, snakes, pests, madhouses, enemies, vanish. They are temporary and will no more be seen. He says if you... What, what, what is it that you are uh, negative? Do you hate spiders and swine, the pigs, uh, snakes, uh, madhouses, prisons? He says what offends you in the world around you will disappear if you're seeing the world right. There is nothing wrong with spiders. There's nothing wrong with snakes. Emerson says if you see them right, they are part of God's creation. You should not be offended by them. You will love them because they are doing what they ought to be doing. He goes even further. Look at this. He says, they are temporary. They shall no more be seen. The sordor and filth of the nature, the sun shall dry up, and the winds exhale. Emerson says, the corpse itself has its own beauty at another spot. If you want, think of the most repulsive experience you could have. He says, think of a rotting corpse. If you remember Whitman last year, he says the same thing. Think of the rotting corpse, putrid, offensive to the senses. Emerson says, if you're responding with disgust, you're misperceiving, because that corpse is going about the natural evolution of things that God created 
And it's a lot better having that corpse turn into flowers than have it lay around like a statue for eons. That's even a proper perception, in other words, will allow you to accept that fact. Emerson lost his first wife after about a year of marriage, Ellen her name was, and he was deeply in love with her. It was a terrible loss for him. And every day for a year, Emerson went to her tomb. She was in an above ground tomb. He went and he stared at the door of the tomb, stared at it. And here's a man whose philosophy is life is good. After a year, he broke open that tomb, opened the door, that is, went in and opened her coffin and looked at her body, which was not embalmed, obviously, had been decomposing for a year. He stared at it, shut the casket, went away, did not come back. It's a very interesting uh, experience. In his journal, all he says is, I went, I opened Ellen's coffin today. Why did he do it? We speculate, we teachers, obviously. I think I know why he did it. I think he wanted to face the reality of death. I think he went daily because he couldn't believe that this young woman who he loved would die. You don't do this on me. And Emerson was not a man who was afraid of facing the horrible or the awful facts of life. The last thing I would want to do would be open the coffin of my, of my wife. But I think Emerson came to the point where he said, I want to know the meaning of death. His journal says nothing about shock. It says nothing about how disgusting it might have been or how awful she may have appeared. It just says, I looked at her and went away. And that broke the need. I suspect that the need faced upon the dis refusal to face the reality of what death meant. He saw death, and afterwards he said, this is, <coughs> he, re he remarried, as you probably know, Lydia Emerson, Lydia Jackson, and had a long and happy marriage with her. He did the same thing many years later when the cemetery in which his mother and his son were, was being moved, his son Waldo, whose, whose uh, eulogy we'll be reading in a few minutes. When, their cemetery, when that cemetery, years after Waldo and, and his mother had died, was being moved, Emerson was to oversee it. He ordered both coffins opened up. This is after Waldo had been dead 10 years, and his mother 15, something like that. He was doing, I think, again, accepting the fact that this is what we participate being, as being alive, and that he is not immune from it, and that it is in fact fine to die and to decompose. It is vision, in other words, is perspective, seeing right. As when the summer comes from the south, the snow banks melt, and the face of the earth becomes green before it, so shall the advancing spirit create its ornaments along its path and carry with it the beauty it visits and the song which enchants it. It shall draw beautiful faces, warm hearts, wise discourse, and heroic acts around its way until evil is seen no more. Emerson does not believe in evil as a distinct opposing element of good. It is one of his absolute enduring faiths. He represents, he does believe it as, a, as an unhappy experience of life. But Emerson will argue constantly that evil is merely a means of good working its way. He's not a Manichaean, in other words. The kingdom of man over nature, which cometh not with observation, of a dominion such as now is beyond his dream of God, he shall enter without more wonder than the blind man feels who is gradually restored to perfect sight. It's, a, it's really a challenge to all of us. Most of what we see in Emerson over the next 25 years of writing comes back to this essay at one point or another. I would encourage you to try reading the whole thing. You'll find it somewhat a chewy <laughs> matter, but, uh, but well worth the effort if you can work your way through it, as you see him working from one point to another. Now let's look just for a minute. Question. Yes. What would he say to the person in <coughs> he would say, first of all, he would say, you created this world. If the world you're living in is a, is a consequence of your failure to see your role as a human being, a right? Person in the madhouse. He, would say, he would say, okay, that's more difficult, right? Well, prison is easy to say. Yes, he, he says, says madhouse. Man no. Emerson probably believes that there will be no madhouses when the time comes that we're seeing right. I think he will say, 
that people who are insane probably are insane not necessarily as a matter of guilt, but as a matter of refusal to see correctly. I, I suspect that he would consistently say that that's what insanity is. Insanity is what you and I go through and pull back from regularly, and what some people simply fall into, seeing a very narrow truth and, uh, and, and, fall, and succumbing to it. The problem here is that when we do this, we tend to think of Emerson speaking in moralistic terms. One should not do this. And since he's a minister, that, that, that moral, was a minister, that moral, moral impetus is very strong. Emerson would not speak of an insane person as morally a consequence of that. But I think he would say that this is what insanity is by definition. It's taking a small portion of truth and saying that's what it is. A mania, in other words, of one kind or another. And that the way out of that, if he were to give psychiatric advice, would I, I suspect very much be a, an advice to the nation or the world around the insane person to say, help them to see, help them to see right, to put it in perspective, to back up so they can see and then become whole. Because the insane person is somebody who succumbs to what you and I fight all the time. We have days of mania, don't we? But uh, we try not to live on our mania. Uh, in practical terms, much of what Emerson says is very difficult in real life. Uh, as I said last week, my own bias is much more towards Melville than towards Emerson. I believe evil is a much stronger force than Emerson does, and I do not believe that all evil ultimately uh, works towards good. But I understand what he's saying, and I wish I could be Emersonian at that, at that crux. I think I would be a, a less balanced person if I refused to read him and refused to catch the truths of what he's saying. But it's a tough, a tough question, especially in the 20th century. How do we who have experienced a World War II uh, face Emerson's essential goodness? There's, there are things that have happened in this century that are so horrifying that you cannot say, ah, but it all works out to good in the end. I'm sure the six million Jews who died in the concentration camps would argue that point rather uh, strongly. You see the point of the problem. <laughs> so I won't deny the, the thrust of that, though I would say that he would, he would not say like a Pollyanna, oh, it doesn't exist. As he goes on, he's much, much stronger. In fact, I'll look at a passage in a minute to show you how he later on picks up the same idea. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, I wonder if living where he did, he didn't see as much evil as there. He didn't see as much of it in his own eyes, no. No, I mean, think of Emerson's life. He, he was not a man who was ignorant of pain by any means, but most of his life was that of a man who was given a good education. He lived in a beautiful village in Massachusetts. His friends were the, the probably the, the greatest group of intellects America has produced. To have people like the Alcotts and Margaret Fuller and Henry David Thoreau living around you when you're in the neighborhood might give you a slightly biased uh, view of what human possibility is like. He, he's not living in First and Pike, or Green Lake for that matter. There's that Cambridge, that, that, that Massachusetts group is uh, it's not Cambridge, it's, uh, uh, what's the town? Uh, Concord. Concord, that Concord group of intellects is quite a, but, uh, but he was not a man who hid behind comfort either. He traveled the country, traveled the country. But his, his house was the White House of its time. It's just beautiful. Isn't that a beautiful? Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful house. When he had the two and had a fight back, he doesn't say too much about that, does he? He tends to take most of his personal problems and simply submit to them. Yes. He works against them. He will not he will not allow them to dominate him. Though you will see in the poem we read later on. His wife died the very same thing just a year after he married yeah. That's right. That's right. But what Emerson would probably argue, what is the alternative? He's not the only man who's lost a young wife. Longfellow did too. It, it was common in those days for men to have two or three wives because women died in childbirth so commonly. Death of children was a common experience. Emerson is being, in a sense, practical. He is a practical man. You cannot bow under the vicissitudes of life, not unless you want to become insane, or as young Goodman Brown does in, the, in Hawthorne's story, become a misogamist, mis not misogynist, mis uh, what's the word for? Misanthropist? A misanthropist, yeah. That is, that, that is, I don't think any of us would say that that is the alternative we would choose, to simply go around saying all people are evil and life is horrible. 
Emerson wants to say to us, you don't have to believe that. You don't have to. And he would not he would not bow to it himself. Um, by the way, just take a, a look, turn back to the essay on fate in, uh, see if I can find it here. Right? Fate. It's on page 330. Now here, fate is a late essay. Turn to 333. <coughs> by the time, we'll talk about this next week. By the time you get to his later essays, he's much more aware of the hard questions we're asking now. We're going too quickly, actually. And the later essays address reality very firmly. Next week, I want to look at some of those. I think you'll find them very attractive. But here's this, philo this, this philosophy, this code he gives us at the end of nature. And see what happens in fate when he talks about the reality of life. And nature says, we tend to make our own house, but get out there and make your house heaven and earth. Make your house whatever you want. But he knows that in living, most of us, my house happens to be 115 Northeast 64th Street. That's reality. He's talking here about the shocks of, reali of reality, disasters. I mean, the things we face just by growing up. Pain and death, sickness and sorrow. He says, these shocks and ruins, it's halfway down the page, you see that? Are less destructive to us. Let me, let's read the previous paragraph. Will you say... The disasters which threaten mankind are exceptional, oh, yeah. and one need not lay his account for cataclysms every day. Aye, but what happens once may happen again, and so long as these strokes are not to be parried by us, they must be feared. Now the point he's making is that those who argue against him, or he's likely to say, well, sure, it's true that there are horrible things that happen. Mount St. Helens will blow. The Jamestown will be flooded. The tornado will sweep over and people will die. And a person could say in response, yes, well, but those happen really only occasionally, and one does not live a life based upon the expectation that Rainier is going to blow every day. Reasonable, isn't it? But Emerson is going to come right back and say, this, this whole business of, of arguing a life based upon cataclysm is ridiculous, since cataclysm doesn't happen on a daily basis. It's occasional. The next sentence, the next paragraph, is much firmer towards what you and I experience in a daily life. These shocks and ruins, in other words, cataclysmic events, are less destructive to us than the stealthy power of other laws which act on us daily. An expense of ends to means is fate. What is it? How did we get from Most of what our life is is giving up the ends for the means. And we know that, we learned long ago, Kant says, you live always towards the end. Means you do not use, make means of ends. You always look to the end product. Goodwill. But most of us <coughs> give up, don't we? And we sort of live on a daily basis. Organization tyrannizing over character. The menagerie of forms and powers of the spine is a book of fate. In other words, you are fated by the per if you have If you're born with a gimpy leg, you're never going to be a cross-country runner. How much you Excuse me, how much you want to be. If you're a woman, you can't become president of the United States, or you name it. He said, we are, we're born trapped already by the spine. As he's talking, he means the physical. Uh, the, the gifts you're given. So the bill of the bird, the skull of the snake, it determines tyrannically its limits. The robin will never become a poet, no matter how much. He's doomed to be a bird forever. So, he says, is the scale of races of temperaments. So is sex. So is climate. So is the reaction of talents imprisoning the vital power in certain directions. Every spirit makes its house. But afterward, the house combines the spirit. And this is a man who's lived about 25 more years. You see. He's, talk he's talking about the reality of having lived a life. He's now well on into adulthood. And he says, what I know is that even though I have argued that you build your own house, the fact is much of it is built for us automatically. What do we do with temperament? We all know people who are just by nature sanguine. They're happy all the time. And how that consequence, how that creates consequences for their lives. Sex. If you're a woman, you're trapped in his day and still today. Certain things you may not do, though there are changes being made, but all the same. If you are given an ugly voice, you will never become a radio broadcaster. <laughs> you name it. 
So we'll see him being more conscious of these limitations later on as time passes. Let's turn over to nine. Well, first I want to read to you, set you against uh, one, find it here, page 91. Now, do not think because Emerson is a man who argues essential goodness, which is what he does, that he's a man who, for whom goodness is a thin kind of a weak Protestant goodness. Let's put it that way. Right? He's, not, uh, he's not Norman Vincent Peale by any means. He wants goodness to be something strong and independent and unique. There's one passage I like very much in the middle of this page from his diary, June 23rd, 1838. So even though he's arguing for goodness, he's not arguing for goodies. And so here he says to himself, I hate goodies. I hate goodness that preaches. Goodness that preaches undoes itself. A little electricity of virtue lurks here and there in kitchens and among the obscure, chiefly women, that flashes out occasional light and makes the existence of the thing still credible. <laughs> Is he right? <laughs> but one had as lief curse and swear as be guilty of this odious religion that watches the beef and watches the cider in the pitcher at the table, that shuts the mouth hard at any remark it cannot twist nor wrench into a sermon, and preaches as long as itself and its hearer is awake. <laughs> Goodies make us very bad. <laughs> we will almost sin despite them. <laughs> Better indulge yourself, feed fat, drink liquors, than go straight laced for such cattle as these. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> I think most of us. I, I feel very responsive to that. I. I, there are certain people who are so goody that you just want to go out and do something horrible <laughs> to shock them. He does not want that. I mean, that's not his idea of what goodness is. Goodness for him is a much stronger, more independent, articulate, uh, self-reliant than just listening to what somebody else says is good and following it. Uh, he would not think much of a lot of the preachers on the radio and TV, the thin ones, the flaccid ones. Turn to, uh, let's see. I want, to, I want to look at self-reliance. Would you rather read Threnody now or Threnody later? <laughs> later, later. Later? Later? This is the poem on the mm -hmm. death of his son. Um, okay, let's do with self, start with self-reliance and come to Threnody later. 147. We're not going to by any means do all of this, but there are certain sections I would like to read to you <coughs> <coughs> to argue. This is his, probably his most important early essay. This is where his preaching of independence, the value of the self, not allowing the world to overwhelm you with its path, pardon me, its traditions, is at its strongest. The students in the university love this essay because of what he asks of, of them. Let's start with the beginning. I'll read a few selected passages to show you how he works this out. I read the other day some verses written by an eminent painter which were original and not conventional. The soul always hear an admonition, hears an admonition in such lines, let the subject be what they may. The sentiment they instill is of more value than any thought they may contain. He's saying there how, how seldom it is we come across somebody who has an original idea. Most everything we read is somebody else's ideas, comes from somebody else. He says, I don't, he says I'm not talking. I'm not talking to say that this man's thought was even worth li listening to. What I am saying is that listening to somebody with his own thoughts is worth listening to, even if the man is totally wrong. That is, facing an original mind is so exciting in a time when most people are not original. Most writers are far from it. Listen to the politicians now. When is the last time you heard <laughs> A politician ever say anything that sounded <laughs> new with, with all his recycled phrases. This is the time of the year. So he says, to believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private thought, your private heart, is true for all men. That is genius. Speak your latent conviction. 
it shall be the universal sense. In other words, if you say what is true in your heart and are willing to stand up for it, every other human being will say you're absolutely right. You can't be wrong. <laughs> it's impossible. If you're a teacher, or some of you are teachers, you, uh, you know that odd, one of the odd truths of teaching is that you encounter students, if you read journals as I do, the outside of the students is so conventional and so self-condemning and so insecure and so weak. And when you read their journals, you find out what good people they are inside. And you say, why, why don't they stand up for themselves? Why don't they assert themselves? All they can do is speak to themselves in their journals or to me. If they had the confidence, everyone's been asked, just to rely on their own morality. Why does some kid go out and get drunk on Saturday night? Because he's too weak to say no to the peer who says, hey, if you don't take this drink, you're a uh, wimp or something. In his journal, he says, why did I do it? I didn't want to do it. And I got uh, hung over as well. Well, they have not reached that point where they can say to the peers, I'm not interested in it. Mark Twain, remember, says, when you're stoning a woman to death, <laughs> with a mysterious stranger, a woman is stoned to death, and the boy who's telling the story picks up a stone and throws it, and Satan, the angel, is taking him through, says, why did you do it? And uh, the boy says, well, everybody else was doing it, and I thought, if I didn't do it, they would think I was a witch too. And Satan says to him, only two people in this crowd wanted to do it. The rest did it because they thought other people were looking. Right? And nobody here had enough guts. It's why Mark Twain hates the human race because they're so gutless, so afraid to stand up for what they believe and what they know is right. They always look first to see what their neighbor is saying or their neighbor is looking at. And Emerson says, just the opposite of Twain, if you do stand up and he believes you can, you can revolutionize life. Milton is that they set at naught books and traditions and spoke not what men, but what they thought. A man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within, more than he lustered than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet he dismisses without notice his thought because it is his. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. I said, we are all too humble, he says. This yes. reminds me, a friend of mine told me this. I went to my uncle's 80th birthday, and she said, her father can't wait till he gets to be really old, because then he can say, say everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You say, you're given a freedom. If you're old enough to say what you like, instead of, instead of uh, you all want to do that boy, when I quit my job, you can take this job and shove it. You, everybody wants the freedom to say Turn over the page. You can re maybe fill in the gaps here. Here's what he's going to argue to us in this essay. We do not express ourselves. He says we but half express ourselves. Then you come to one of his favorite, his famous lines. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. He's talking about harmonics there. You listen to that phrase and you should feel inside. Yes, I know that I am, I am a good person. I knew a student once who was a very, very fine person, and she was, her father did everything he could to beat her down. He called her cheap, I mean, all these things that people do. And she was gradually reaching the point where she was using the, the language on herself. Said, hey, are you this way? Are you a cheap girl? No, I'm not, and I knew she wasn't. Then don't listen to that language. You've got to be responsive to that sense of the value of your interior if you're going to live a life at all. You can't let someone else give you language to destroy yourself. You'd like to see people respond to that. Accept the place the divine providence has for you, the society of your contemporaries, the connection of events. Great men have always done so. You see what a great person is by his definition? It's the person who accepts that challenge. It doesn't, greatness then for, for Emerson is not genius necessarily. It's, it's keeping access open, keeping access to what's good inside of you and, and relying on it, on your own instinct, your own self. So turn over the next page on 149. He says, all by ourselves, 
if you're sitting by yourself, you have you can trust yourself usually. But one of the great sins of life is the consequence of society and our response to the world around us. And here's where he comes to some famous Emersonian passages on page 149. These are the voices which we hear in solitude. That is the voice of, yes, I'm all right. We hear this in ourselves, by ourselves. But they grow faint and inaudible as we enter into the world. Society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Right? Society wants to take away your manhood, your independence, your trust of yourself. Society is a joint stock company in which the members agree for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. When you join society, you give up independence of judgment. Society says, okay, we'll clothe you and feed you, but you do what we say is right. Yes, you, you're right, that's it, conform. The virtue most in request is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore if it be goodness. Right? Most of us were raised in church. Most of us listen to the preacher, the minister, the priest, say, this is what it is to be good. Emerson is going to say, this is society talking to you. If you are good because you obey the priest, you're not good. That's by definition, as I said, it's obedience, but it's not exploring what goodness is. You have to find on your own. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. That is, if you do it for your own reasons, then you are, you're living the life you ought to lead. Absolve you to yourself, you will have the suffrage of the world. I remember an answer, which when I, when quite young, I was prompted to make to a valued advisor who was wont to importune me with the dear old doctrines of the church. On my saying, what have I to do with the sacredness of traditions if I live wholly from within? My friend suggested, but these impulses may be from below, not from above. I replied, they do not seem to me to be such, but if I am the devil's child, I will live then from the devil. You can imagine what the, <coughs> the good man thought. And you go, no law can be sacred to me but that of my nature. Now, Emerson is a great one. For a shocking reader. This is 1830, uh, 1839, 1840. Imagine the contemporary reader coming upon this, where he says, If I'm the devil's child, then I will live with the devil. He wants to. Now, you always have to step back with Emerson and take the shock first, which is what he intends. But he's going, What is the point with Emerson? What's the, very, the crucial point about the, what he believes of human nature? Yes, right. And that is. You, you can't be the devil's child if you rely on your greatest strength inside your interior. That is, you will be God's child because he believes that it's God that's in there. So he's allowing this man's preconceptions about human nature, this is a Calvinist world after all, to let the man have his shock. But Emerson's going to say, I mean, I don't for a minute believe that if I rely on my interior, I will be living a life of damnation. He believes that that is where good is. And that's how you find good. But he let the man have his shock. Good and, ne and bad, our names are just names, very readily transferable to that and this. The only right is what is after my constitution. The only wrong, what is against it. A man is to himself in the presence, is to carry himself in the presence of all opposition as if, as if everything were titular and ephemeral but he. And he goes, this is a wonderfully shocking page. I am ashamed to think how easily we capitulate to badges and names, to large societies and dead institutions. Every decent and well-spoken individual affects and sways me more than is right. See, the, for Emerson, one of the great dangers of life is that good people are so admirable. <laughs> it's, 
if somebody's, it's not the bad people that are dangerous to him, because he knows, but somebody who's a good, upright, kind, generous person, and you say, well, I really ought to live like him. You know what? No. You live like yourself. Let that person be good in his own way. He says, the great, t the great danger for anybody who thinks about goodness is that other people are good. They, they tempt you. They tempt you to be good the way they are good. I ought to go upright and vital and speak the rude truth in all ways. If malice and vanity were the code of philanthropy, shall that pass? This is a tough time. When this was written, philanthropy was a big deal, uh, especially towards the uh, abolition movement was going fast, moving towards the Civil War. And Emerson looked around him and saw all these people who were involved in, abol in the abolition movement, that is, good causes. And he looked at them and he said, underneath the good cause is vanity and malice and cruelty. He says, what do I do to somebody who comes up and says, hey, Waldo, we've got to give money to free the slaves in the Barbados. And this man goes home and beats his wife. What's he supposed to do? If he doesn't give to the cause, then he will get the reputation of, you know, Emerson, he's in favor of slavery, eh? But this is a, a very common problem. He says, if, shall it pass if an angry bigot assumes this bountiful cause of abolition and comes to me with his last news from the Barbados? Why should I not say to him, go love thy infant, love thy wood chopper, be good-natured and modest, have that grace, and never varnish your hard, uncharitable ambition with this incredible tenderness for black folk a thousand miles off. <laughs> Thy love afar is spite at home. Rough and graceless would be such a greeting, but truth is handsomer than the affectation of love. Your goodness must have some edge to it, else it is none. Edge, you know what that means, right? Your goodness must have some edge to it. You've got to be sharp, not soft, not goodies, in other words. That's right. The doctrine of hatred must be preached as the counteraction of the doctrine of love when that pules and whines. I shun father and mother and wife and brother when my genius calls me. I write on the lintels of the doorpost If I was at the U, I, every time I taught this essay, I always wrote it along the door. There are about 18 different classrooms in Washington that have my, and nobody ever wipes them off. <laughs> I won't dare do it here because some of them. But he says, I put it, I put that over, he's doing this for shock too. I do what is, what is the consequence of oneness with my spirit. Whim for him is a different word, obviously, from what it is for us. For me, whim is so very minor, casual thing. I do something on a whim. But he's saying, I follow the interior. And I would rather you take this word and use that than a lot of other words. Do what is what is what is right for you now. Right now, this time. Today, not yesterday. And if today you do something that's different from what you said you would do yesterday, oh, hey, what the heck? <laughs> today I'm different from what I was yesterday. Whim. He says, then he picks it up. I hope it is somewhat better than whim at last. He would hope that it isn't just whim. But we cannot spend the day in explanation. <laughs> just don't ask me to give an explanation of, of all of this. Expect me not to show cause why I seek or why I exclude company. Then again, do not tell me, as a good man did today of my obligation, to put all poor men in good situations. Are they my poor? I tell thee, thou foolish philanthropist, that I grudge the dollar the dime, the cent I give to such men as do not belong to me and to whom I do not belong. You hear that? Any of you ever give a dollar to somebody who comes to the door just to get rid of them? Right? Someone says, oh, please, here's a charity. It's a very good charity, right? The feeding of poor people in Uganda or something like that. And you really don't have the money. And you'd rather give your money that you have to give to some other charity. But you think, well, right, I will feel bad about myself. Emerson says, I grudge every nickel I give. To somebody that is not given, right, when I'm not giving it out of my own sense of why I'm doing it. Why do I have to give a dollar to, to the millionaire club because somebody comes up and says, give me a dollar? He's, he's trying to shock you, just really, because everybody knows that you should give generously. He says, I give to my people, to my causes, 
Is he opposed to giving? No. No. But he's opposed to giving for the wrong reasons. If you donate your 10% to church because the church says you got to tithe, it's a sin. It's a sin. That is evil money. Every nickel you give because you do it with a grudging conscience is a sin. That's right. I grudge the dollar, the dime, the cent I give to such men as do not belong to me and to whom I do not belong. There is a class of persons to whom by all spiritual affinity I am bought and sold. For them I will go to prison if I need be. But your miscellaneous popular charity, the education at College of Fools, the building of meeting houses to the vain end to which many now stand, alms to sots and the thousandfold relief societies, Though I confess with shame, I sometimes succumb and give the dollar. It is a wicked dollar, which by and by, I hope I shall have the manhood to withhold. Okay, let's take a short break and come back to uh, self-reliance. Okay, let's skip over a paragraph and watch how this goes. This is a, a super essay, and he constantly hits us for we know things ought to be said, which, by the way, is a sign of his genius on his own terms. Uh, middle of the next page. <clears throat> uh, pick up towards the end of that paragraph. The great man is he who, in the midst of the crowd, keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude, and who lives by his own codes. At the end of the middle paragraph. 151. The objection to conforming to usages that have become dead to you is that it scatters your force. Doing because because something has been done, conforming because you've always conformed, you lose your power. It loses your time, blurs the impression of your character. If you maintain a dead church, contribute to a dead Bible society, Vote with a great party, either for the government or against it. Spread your table like base housekeepers. Under all these screens, I have difficulty to, to detect the precise man you are. I'll, you, I'll let you know a little bit about my politics. I try to live in some ways Emersonian. And this paragraph came up to me two years ago when I saw personally in November two people, neither one of whom I would vote for, under any circumstances. And all my friends were saying, well, are you going to vote for Carter, who's incompetent, or Reagan, who's a fool? Right? And, uh, I thought about it more and more, and all I did was get mad that, that the two parties had given me two people so thoroughly unacceptable. And I told Sandy, who finally voted for, my, for Carter because she was afraid of Reagan, I said, I don't care what Anderson stands for. I'm voting for him. Just to tell them that my vote is not to be determined by... <coughs> the politicians. And I've not regretted it, by the way. I, I really don't care what Anderson stands for, but I'm really grateful that there was somebody on the ballot that I could say, I'm not going to cut my political convictions to fit the body that you have put in front of me in politics. Now you know my politics. I, I'm opposed to everybody. Right? <laughs> he says, if you, if you do, if you succumb to that, how do I know? How do my friends know what I am if I allow the exteriors like that to determine what my political actions are. I've got to do it on my own. You lose your precision of person. Somehow stand on your own feet. Under all these screens, I have difficulty to detect the precise man you are. And of course, so much force is withdrawn from your proper life. But do your work. It shall know, show, it shall know you. Do your work. You shall reinforce yourself. A man must consider what a game of blind man's bluff this game of conformity is. Mm -hmm. One of his great geniuses as a writer, is ex he's talking about abstractions, and Emerson, more than anybody else, knows how to pick a common image. I mean, the whole idea of blind man's bluff, put on that, <laughs> right, that uh, bandana, and there you are. If I know your sect, I anticipate your argument. Right? Curious how that happens. Is it true? Aha, you teach at Eastside Catholic High School. Therefore, <laughs> there was a conference last weekend at uh, Lakeside and Bush, the Pacific Northwest Independent School Association. And uh, Eastside was there for the first time. 
one of the features of our school is that unlike all the other Catholic high schools, we say Catholic. The truth is we are not attached to the church in any way, <clears throat> even though Catholic is in our name. We're a school that's owned by the lay Catholics on the east side. But when we met with my colleagues who went to that, when, we, when they met the other teachers from Lakeside and Bush and uh, Charles Wright and Annie Wright and all those schools, they found that as soon as they saw Catholic on there, they got this tremendous reaction. Ah, oh, we know what these people are like. <laughs> and to get them to see us individually was very, very difficult because they had a preconception of what a person who teaches in a Catholic high school would be like. But this is true for all of us, isn't it? Ah, you're over 65. I know what you're like. <laughs> or you're a student. Or endlessly. If I know your sect, I anticipate your argument. I hear a preacher announce for his text and topic the expediency of one of the institutions of his church. Do I not know beforehand that not possibly can he say a new and spontaneous word? <laughs> Do I not know that with all this ostentation of examining the grounds of the institution, he will do no such thing. <laughs> do I not know that he is pledged to himself not to look but at one side, the permitted side, not as a man, but as a parish minister? He is a retained attorney. <laughs> and these heirs of the bench are the emptiest affectation. Well, most men have bound their eyes with one or another handkerchief and attached themselves to some one of these communities of opinion. This conformity makes them not false in a few particulars, authors of a few lies, but false in all particulars. You see, he's, he's asking for, for, for radical independence. And it isn't hard to see how revolutionary Emerson can be to young people. <laughs> so you can, they, they, they respond in revolutionary ways. For nonconformity, the next paragraph, the world whips you with its displeasure. Therefore, a man must know how to estimate a sour face. The bystanders look askance on him in the public street or in the friend's parlor. If this aversion had its origin in contempt and resistance like his own, he might well go home with a sad countenance. But the sour faces of the multitude, like their sweet faces, have no deep cause, but are put on and off as the wind blows and the newspaper directs. <laughs> so have courage. Okay, the first point he makes is you must not conform for the sake of conformity. The other great, what's the word, code coming up. The other terror that scares us from self-trust is our consistency, a reverence for our past act or word, because the eyes of others have no other data for computing our orbit than our past acts. We are loath to disappoint them. He thinks this is just as bad. Consistency is just as bad as conformity. Conformity is responding to the demands of the world around you. Consistency is, co is, cor is, is corresponding to the demands of the past you once were, what you once said, once, what you once did. Why should you keep your head over your shoulder? Why drag about this corpse of your memory, lest you contradict something you have stated in this or that public place? Suppose you should contradict yourself. What then? It seems to be a rule of wisdom never to rely on your memory alone, scarcely even an act of pure memory, but to bring the past for judgment into the thousand-eyed present and live ever in a new day. In your metaphysics, you have denied personality to the deity, yet when the devout motions of the soul come, yield to them heart and life, though they should clothe God with shape and color. Leave your theory as Joseph, his coat in the hand of the harlot, Flee. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. <laughs> Very famous lines, as you know. Whether you've ever read this, you know that phrase. I, I can't read Emerson, but constantly think how, how right he is all the time in real life. What you would give for any politician to stand up and say, I changed my mind. <laughs> There's nothing worse for a politician than for somebody to say, didn't you say in 1942, Mr. Reagan? And to have any, if, if any politician could just say, well, but that's what I thought then, and now I think differently. None of them ever have the courage to do that. You notice that? They always try to defend it and say, well, really, I didn't change my mind. The world changed, but I'm exactly where I used to be. 
No, why can't a person say, I think I was totally wrong, and now I'm right? Now I can't. They can't but you can't change your mind. Yes? As I remember, Governor Brown did that in California over that Proposition 13, and he's been down for He changed his mind? He changed his mind. Yeah. See, I, would, I think I would admire somebody who would do that. Maybe not. Well, I don't think so. No, I would think so. They, the, but you see what they're doing. It's a God. It's a God. Because what Emerson is going to say is that the truth is you know that as you grow, you change. And if you believe that consistency with your past is a virtue, you're going to live in misery for as long as you live. Because you have, do you want to be the same person you were when you were 25? Or when you were 30? Let's hope not, since you've lived and supposedly learned and evolved. <clears throat> By the way, notice there's a certain amount of uh, hubris involved here. He may as well concern himself with his shadow on the wall. That's the great man. Speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again. Though it contradict everything you said today. Mm -hmm. Ah, so you shall be sure to be misunderstood. Is it so bad, then, to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Luther, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh. To be great is to be misunderstood. <laughs> is that true? <clears throat> Students will occasionally say, would he include Emerson on that list? <laughs> I, suppose so. I suppose he would. This, the essay then goes on at this point to look closely at conformity and consistency and get rid of it. On the next page, I hope in these days we have heard the last of conformity <coughs> and consistency. Let the words be gazetted and ridiculous henceforward. Instead of, going for din go instead of the gong for dinner, let us hear a whistle from the Spartan fight. Let us never bow and apologize more. A great man is coming to my house. I do not wish to please him. I wish that he should wish to please me. <laughs> Probably it was the role that was coming for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I will stand here for humanity, and though I would make it kind, I would make it true. Let us affront and reprimand the smooth mediocrity and squalid contentment of the times, and hurl in the face of custom and trade and office the fact which is the upshot of all history that there is a great responsible thinker and actor working wherever a man works, that a true man belongs to no other time or place that is the center of all things. But well, I think that's uh, enough for you to see the incredible strength that Emerson offers you if you are willing to pick up this confidence in interior that we all have as human beings. It's a long essay. You might try reading it and see what comes of it as you go on. <coughs> Turn over to page... 160 for a last point or two from uh, self-reliance. Dr. Colbert, how do you work with kids, you know, to teach them, though, to make a stand? It's the most difficult thing, especially at the age you're teaching yeah. now. Well, I don't know that I teach them to make a stand. Mm -hmm. I think I try to get them to see the value of the independence and of relying upon their own, essentially, very positive evidence of goodness. Um, it's a very interesting question because we had a senior pilgrimage this weekend. And one of the advantages of the place I work now is that it works in a strong Christian tradition. And what the religious education at East Side tries, I think more than anything else to do, is to give the, the uh, students there a sense of their independent value as human beings. And that uh, they are not doctrinaire by any means. I'm not Catholic myself, as you probably know. But watching them help the students say, I have the ability to make my own judgments, to live my own life, to leave this school at 18 and become an adult and have some confidence that there's something to rely on, is what I think the school does just generally. In the, in the broadest sense, I think most of the classes orient themselves towards that self-growth, independence, reliability. There's one reason I think I would not be interested in working in a public high school. I think it would be very hard to you don't have the central ethos that the, the private school has. Which is not to count them down. I mean, it's, I'm sure, a very wonderful profession. I know a lot of people who are great teachers. But I find the, rely the ability to rely on the community support that this school has uh, very nice. 
On the other hand, I did it all those years at, at UW. I think teaching, even teaching literature teaches that. That's what literature is about. But you have to be more circuitous in how you argue the case. <laughs> 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 uh, my daughter has an English teacher at Blanchett who she likes very much. And he said a parent's name. He said sometimes we, in discussing this literature, we, all, we get philosophical. I don't, I've never worked in a public high school, so I don't know what the consequence of that would be. But the human orientation of literature makes it impossible to avoid it in literature. In the classes you teach, you've got to talk. If you're going to teach Emerson, this is Emerson. He's, you should not be an American. You should not grow to adulthood in America and not have encountered this man. Because so much of his thought permeates our lives today. Even the sentences that you've already come across that you know. You should know where they come from, what they mean. Whether you're, whatever your religious perspective might be. Good to have in your head. It's an interesting problem. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, at the bottom of page 160, you get that one defense I wanted you to make sure. When he says, "I find of the devil, so be it. I'm the devil's child." One of the feared responses that he got, and he tried to cut to face pretty regularly, was the conservative Christian response: "If you don't rely on the church and the rules of the church." was to prevent you from becoming a simple, shallow hedonist, a, a sensualist. Why can't you just go out and do your own thing? This is the century of that. Emerson has a fairly strong re rebuttal of that. Emerson would not become that kind of person because of what he believes the interior of the human spirit uh, uh, is. The populists think that your rejection of popular standards is a rejection of all standards. Yes. Well, bottom yes. of the page. And mere antinomianism. And the bold sensualist will use the name of philosophy to gild his crimes. That is, many a person who is nothing more than a sensualist will say he's doing it on philosophical grounds. I mean, Playboy had the Playboy philosophy for, for years, didn't they, as Hugh Hefner tried to give substance to what he was enjoying doing. There are two confessionals. I'm sorry. But the law of consciousness abides. There are two confessionals, in one or the other of which we must be shriven. You may fulfill your round of duties by clearing yourself in the direct or in the reflex way. What he's saying here is that you must come to judgment some way. You cannot not. That's what he means by shriven. The confessional is when you go to the priest and disburden yourself of your lives. If you're a sensualist, you're going to find yourself missing one of the most important elements in life. Consider whether you have satisfied your relations to father, mother, cousin, neighbor, Tom, cat and dog, you know that sequence. <laughs> Whether any of these can upbraid you. That is, that's, uh, but I also may also neglect this reflex standard and absolve me to myself. This, the reflex standard of action, have I done what is right, is, is in terms of what people around you can say to you. Have you honored your father and mother? Do you treat your pets right, your Tom? You can judge yourself, in other words, by the response of the world around you. But there's another way of doing it. You can do it right in, in your interior. I may also neglect this reflex standard and absolve me to myself. I have my own stern claims and perfect circle. It denies the name of duty to many offices that are called duties. But if I can discharge its debts, it enables me to dispense with the popular code. If anyone imagines that this law is lax, they didn't keep its commandments one day. Uh, and if you know Emerson's life, you know that he was far from being a revolutionary liver. He was a, a loving husband and a kind father who worked hard all of his life. Because the consequence of his philosophy was not that he spent his whole life on the town because he was free of the Ten Commandments. Far from it. He held himself up to enormously rigid standards of, of behavior in life. I think those of us who come out of the Christian perspective we recognize this is right out of the New Testament, isn't it? I mean, this is what Christ said and what Paul says in the New Testament. That being a Christian means, in essence, you do not have to obey the Ten Commandments. They're irrelevant. That's the law. But Christ says you have to, you have to live as a Christian, which is a heck of a lot harder than following the Ten Commandments. Right? It's your interior. It's how you feel about yourself. So this is right in line with the tradition, the religion that Emerson has always 
as, as a, in terms of his family, always followed. Well, that's the, you know, there, there is an opening essay in which we see Emerson saying, this is what I expect of man, and of me, and of you, if we live at our best. Next week, we'll go back and see some expansions, limitations, uh, as a result of experience on that. But let's look at how real life hit him hard in terms of uh, sadness. And I'd like to look at Threnody, this poem. It's one of the great poems of sorrow and loss in American literature. So it's uh, not all a good poem. There's some of it that's very good. He had a, a boy named Waldo who died very young, uh, 10 or 12, something like that. <clears throat> and uh, one of the, uh, the odd truths about this boy is that from the evidence of everybody who knew him, he was absolutely an exceptional child. He was happy, uh, outgoing, played joyously. He was not of bad temperament. Uh, Thoreau used to come over regularly and make little toys for him out of wood. That is, everything you read in the poem about the nature of the loss of the boy is, is true. He was a great loss. And I did quite a bit of research at one time to find somebody who say, well, really, Waldo was a brat from the beginning. But I, I never found anybody who could say that. So, yes. Threnody. Threnody. It means a song of death. Threnody. <coughs> Excuse me. 428. <coughs> yes, 428. The first opening, the first section of this poem is a poem of loss. Yes. That's the death song. Morning. And I'll tell you something about how this poem was written. The first half of the poem was written shortly after Waldo's death and ends on one of the saddest notes of any poem you'll ever read. Ten year, ten, 14 years later, Emerson picked up the poem and finished it, in which he comes to terms with death. Emerson did not write this whole poem as some kind of philosophical confrontation, how, how much, how, how happy he was to, uh, to uh, face death and overcome it. No, he had to live in misery as a result of this. He's not a starry-eyed Pollyanna. And here's, we'll read the poem through, and I'll talk about parts of it. The south wind brings life, sunshine, and desire, and on every mountain meadow breathes aromatic fire, but over the dead has no power. The lost, the lost he cannot restore. And looking over the hills, I mourn, darling, you shall not return. Sad beginning. Poets know one of the crucial truths of human life is that April is the cruelest month. It breeds, it brings new life out of the dead land, doesn't it? And nature constantly tells us, hey, there are new flowers every spring, but he's not coming back. As we live one circle of the endless circle of life, and anyone who thinks realizes that nature's repetition, rebirth, is something that we do not have in this world. And he says, here is the south wind bringing forth life again, but my son is gone. I see my empty house. I see my trees repair their boughs. And he, the wondrous child, whose silver warble wild outvalued every pulsing sound, within the air, cerulean round, hyacinthine boy, for whom morn well might break and eat April bloom, the gracious boy, who did adorn the world wherein he was born, and by his countenance repay the favor of the loving day, has disappeared from the day's eye. Far and wide, she cannot find him. My hopes pursue, they cannot find him. Turn this day, the south wind searches and finds young pines and budding birches, but finds not the budding man. Nature who lost cannot remake him. Fate let him fall. Fate can't retake him. Nature, fate, men, him seek in vain. You look, what does he see everywhere? You see, he finds young pines and budding birches. All people, why did he die? Fate, fate didn't fall. This is not a game that can be played over again. And his great grief at that permanence of loss. Much of the opening part of the poem is that painfulness of, 
of the free conscious saying to yourself, so you understand it. He's dead. He's dead. You have to face that, that reality in spite of all your habits and all the signs of life. It reminds me of, of that, that unbearable moment in, in To the Lighthouse when Mr. Ramsey, after Mrs. Ramsey has died, is going down the stairs and instinctively turns with his arms open in a gesture of love for her, his wife. And Virginia Woolf says she's not there. Right? She's not there. Oh, whither now, my truant, wise and sweet? Oh, whither tend thy feet? I had the right few days ago, thy steps to watch, thy place to know. How have I forfeited the right? That's another Often when someone dies, the first reaction is, what did I do? What, what have I done that you died? As though the person who, who lives is to blame. How have I forfeited the right to have you in my life? Hast thou forgot me in a new delight? I hearken for thy household cheer, O eloquent child, whose voice an equal messenger conveyed thy meaning mild. What though the pains and joys whereof it spoke were toys, fitting his age and ken, Yet fairest dames and bearded men who heard the sweet request, so gentle, wise, and grave, bended with joy to his behest, and let the world's affairs go by, a while to share his cordial game or mend his wicker wagon frame, still plotting how their hungry ear that winsome voice again might hear, for his lips could well pronounce words that were persuasions. That specifically refers to the Emerson family friends. Thoreau, in particular, was, was very enamored of this boy and used to come just to play with him. And em Emerson is saying, this, the boy was not beyond his years. He was just a kid. But he was so pleasant a child that intellectual Har Harvard graduates would more than be more than happy to put aside the day's business to spend some time with his spirit. Gentless guardians marked serene his early hope, his liberal mean took counsel from his guiding eyes to make this wisdom earthly wise. Ah, vainly do these eyes recall the school march, each day's festival when every morn my bosom glowed to watch the convoy on the road, the babe in willow wagon closed with rolling eyes and face composed, with children forward and behind, like Cupid studiously inclined, and he, the chieftain, paced beside the center of the truth allied with sunny face of sweet repose to guard the babe from fancy foes. Anyone who's ever watched his child go off to school with his friends would know that sort of loving, that's my boy, feeling that Emerson's talking about. The little captain, innocent, took the eye with him as he went. Each village senior paused to scan and speak the lovely caravan. From the window I look out to mark that beautiful parade stately marching in cap and coat to some tune by fairies played, a music heard by thee alone to works as noble led thee on. That's memory. And now the next pa passage is particularly painful because he's only been dead a short time. And Emerson looks out the window and he sees all the evidence of the child, his toys, just lying there as though he were coming back in a moment. Now love and cry, alas, in vain. Up and down, their glances strain. The painted sled stands where it stood. The kennel by the corded wood is gathered sticks to staunch the wall of the snow tower when snow should fall. The ominous hole he dug from the sand, childhood's castles built or planned. His daily haunts I well discern. The poultry yard, the shed, the barn, and every inch of garden ground paced by the blessed feet around, from the roadside to the brook, whereinto he loved to look, step the meek fowls where first they ranged, the wintry garden lies unchanged. The brook to the stream runs on, but the deep eyed boy is gone. On that shaded day, dark with more clouds than tempests are, when thou didst yield thy innocent breath in bird-like heavings unto death. Night came, and nature had not been. I said, we are needs and misery. Tomorrow dawned with needless glow, 
Each snowbird chirped, each owl must crow, each tramper started, but the feet of the most beautiful and sweet of human youth had left the hill and garden. They were bound and still. There's not a sparrow or a wren, there's not a blade of autumn grain, which the four seasons do not tend, and tides of life an increase lend, and every chick of every bird, and weed and rock moss is preferred. A ostrich like forgetfulness, a loss of larger in the less. Was there no star that could be sent, no watcher in the firmament? No angel from the countless host that loiters round the crystal coast could stoop to heal that only child, nature's sweet marble undefiled, and keep the blossom of the earth, which all her harvests will not live. Not mine. I never called thee mine, but nature's heir. If I repine on seeing rashly torn and moved, not what I made, but what I loved, Grow early old with grief that thou must to the waste of nature go. Tis because a general hope was quenched, and all must doubt and grow. For flattering planets seem to say, This child should ills of ages stay by wondrous tongue and guided pen. Bring the flow news back to men. Perchance not he, but nature ail, the world, and not the end of fail was not ripe yet to sustain a genius of so fine a strain, who gazed upon the sun and moon as if he came into his own, and pregnant with his grander thought, brought the old order into doubt. His beauty, once their beauty tried, they could not be him, and he died. He wandered backward as in scorn, to wait an eon to be born. Ill day, which made this beauty waste, plight broken, this high face defaced. What happened when he died? The people come about their mourning. Some went and came about the dead, and some in books of solace read. Some to their friends the tidings say, some went to write, some went to pray. One tarried here, there hurried one, but their heart of old with none. Covetous death bereaved us all to agonize one funeral. The eager fate which carried thee took the largest part of me. For this losing is true dying. This is lordly man's down life. This is slow but sure to find. Star by star, this world is mine. Those are the best lines he ever wrote. It's so painful to read, because I have an awful time reading them without breaking out of tears. As though, as, how do you talk about losing your child? What is it to humble a man, and a, pry, a proud man, a man of substance and position? This is how you do it. This is how you do it. Covetous death bereaved us all to aggrandize one people. The eager fate which carried thee took the largest part of me. This music is true dying. This is Lord Man's down line. This is slow but sure refining. Star by star is world is I told you at one time I thought he couldn't write poetry, but I changed my mind. Uh, a lot of a lot of what he's, he writes I do not like, but occasionally he's simply incomparably beautiful and moving when he tries to express the truth. Oh child of paradise boy who made dear his father's home and whose deep eyes men read the welfare of the times to come. I am too much bereft.